one of the things that we're going to talk about, the, the name of the series is Cracking the Code from Genesis to Revelation. If you saw it in the paper or if you heard it on the radio, it, this is very important because one of the things that we need to understand is that the Bible is inspired from beginning to end. A lot of people that I know will say that uh, I'm a New Testament Christian and I believe that we have to be Bible Christians, amen? So if we believe the Bible, we have to take it as a whole. And the book of Genesis is very foundational to our understanding of the whole Bible. In fact, I believe that all of the doctrines of the Bible can be taught in the first 10 or 12 chapters of Genesis. And you will see some of that throughout this series. And we've been challenged with that when we've said that in the past, but it's amazing the things that you will find in Genesis. It's really important to understand the book of Genesis because the word Genesis actually means origin or beginning, right? So, in fact, the word genuine, Genesis, does it sound similar? Genuine is the original. So has anyone ever been the victim of counterfeiting? Maybe you have been and you don't even know it. You see, the thing about a counterfeit is you have to have something genuine in order to have a counterfeit. If you've, have you ever seen a counterfeit U.S. $4 bill? No, because there's no genuine $4 bill in the United States. Now, other countries may have a $4 bill, but we don't here. So it's interesting that most bankers, when they are studying the money and how to tell a counterfeit, they never look at a counterfeit. And why is that? Why should I waste my time looking at something that is counterfeit, when if I know what the real one looks like, it'll allow me to be able to spot a counterfeit much quicker, won't it? So I have to know what the original looks like. Once I know what the genuine looks like, as soon as I see a counterfeit, I can spot it just like that. So let's look at the words here. I'm going to look at the word genuine. And, and we're going to start off with a few things before we jump into the Bible. Genuine, this is the definition. Truly what something is said to be. Something that's authentic. So being genuine is being authentic. Well, let's define authentic. What does that mean? It says authentic is of undisputed origin. And then it points you back to genuine of undisputed origin. So you can leave that door open, Mary, if you like. It'll be fine. Unless, if you want to close it, you can. I just figure people outside can see if we, if we leave it open. So um, here are some synonyms for genuine. Authentic, real, actual, original, bona fide, true. What do we have there? Veritable, attested, undisputed. And attested means proven, something that's proven. Uh, next, we have the word counterfeit. Counterfeit, made in exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. A counterfeit is always to defraud. And it's always a copy of something that's genuine. It says a fraudulent imitation of something else or a forgery. Now, pay particular attention to something. I'm highlighting these words for you. Imitation, intention to deceive or defraud. Fraudulent imitation of something else. And here are a few synonyms for counterfeit. Fake, faked, bogus, forgery, imitation. Have you heard these words before? Copy, reproduction, spurious, substitute, fraudulent, knockoff, sham, or phony. So in order to have a counterfeit, there has to be a genuine. Now, I want to ask you a quick question, just a little trivia question. Which products do you think are the most counterfeited products in the world today? Anybody want to guess? Money. Money. Believe it or not. Well, let's say the most counterfeited products. Did I say that? Products. Handbags. That's very good. Number one, handbags and wallets. If you've ever been to New York City, you go to Chinatown, and you're walking down the street, they'll say handbag, 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 Rolex, Rolex. Number two is watches, Rolex, Omega, all of these things. Number three, the most counterfeited things in the world is apparel and jewelry. 
or accesses, accessories. Everything from a Cartier necklace to Tiffany earrings to Ray-Ban sunglasses, these things are being counterfeited. You can buy Oakley sunglasses. If you buy the real thing, they're very expensive, but you can go to a city like Chicago or New York and you can buy Oakleys for eight bucks, but they're counterfeits. And you can tell if you know what to look for. Number four, consumer electronics and parts. Believe it or not, smartphones and iPhones and tablets and ca uh, televisions and cameras, all of these things are counterfeited. Yes, if you have an iPhone, it could be a counterfeit. Believe it or not. Even electronic parts, computer motherboards, thumb drives, circuit boards, it just seems endless. Number five is, here we go, pharmaceuticals. This is number five. Counterfeit drugs have been reported to cause serious side effects and death, much more than the side effects that you even see on the TV commercials. This can be horrible. In this country, fortunately, if you buy the drugs in this country, we have a way, they, they actually, it's, it's very unlikely if you buy from a regular pharmacy to get them, but if you cross the border, chances are you're going to get a counterfeit, even though you think you're buying the real thing. And the, everything from aspirin to morphine to Xanax has been counterfeited. Number six are movies. Believe it or not, if a movie comes out this Friday, by Saturday morning you can go on the street and buy a counterfeit movie of the movie that just came out, that was just released. Any big city. Shoes, number seven. Designer labels and tags. A lot of people want to buy a product with a particular tag or label on it. Even those tags are counterfeited. The little lapel tag or whatever might be on your shirt. When I was in high school, it was a little alligator. I don't know what company that was, but that was the thing back then. So we look again, number nine is toys. Everything from G.I. Joe to Barbie to board games, counterfeit. And then number 10, believe it or not, are food products. Especially when food prices start to rise more and more, everything from Lindor chocolates to bananas to you name it, have been counterfeited. You think you're buying a dull banana? You may not be. So really, the only way to truly be safe is to buy from people that you trust and make sure the price isn't too good to be true. Because chances are, if the price is too good to be true, it could very well be a counterfeit. So that being said, let's look at a few facts. Counterfeiting costs the United States businesses 200 to $250 billion a year. Counterfeit merchandise is directly responsible for the loss of more than 750,000 American jobs. And approximately 5 to 7% of world trade is in counterfeit goods. That's tremendous. Another fact. Here we go. U.S. companies suffer $9 billion in trade losses due to international copyright piracy. So, the genuine or the counterfeit. Now, one question I want to ask, did you realize that sometimes even religions are counterfeited? Have you ever heard that? A counterfeit religion. Well, let's take a look at a few things. If you look at these names right here, these are the names of gods that are listed in the Bible. These names are listed in your Bible, if you have a copy of the Bible. And let me ask you, are these true gods or false gods? False. That's correct. Now, how do I know that? How do you know that? That's a good question, isn't it? When somebody says, well, you proved to me that one of these gods is the false god, where do you start? Well, that's what we're going to do this evening. How can we identify the true god? You know, if I were to walk into a room full of men, and I walked in, and everybody was facing the other direction, and I said, excuse me, sir, how many men would turn around? Every one of them. Because sir is nothing more than a title. That's all it is. And every man in there could rightfully turn around and say, are you talking to me? The problem is, most of us learn about the counterfeit first. So the problem is, the genuine can be hard to detect. For example, if all I was exposed to was monopoly money, and that's all I'd ever seen as a child. That's all I saw pretty much, right? You play the game, you play the games, and you take that money and you go to your dad and you say, Dad, can I get two tens for this 20? 
What he's going to give you is worth much more than what you're giving him, isn't it? You see, if all I'd ever seen was Monopoly money, it would be hard for me to... I'd know that it looked different, but I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But right away, as soon as you see Monopoly money, you know that it's counterfeit. It's no different than the God we worship. Most of us are a product of our environment. We grow up in a particular environment. If we grew up over in the Middle East, we may not be here tonight listening to a message about a God and a son, a father and a son. We may not be Christian if we live in another country. Some here may not be Christian. Well, hopefully after tonight, you'll have a better idea of why I'm doing this lecture and why it's so important. There seems to be no end to those who truly believe that we're true and right and we're worshiping the true God. But are we? This brings us to an all-important question. Who is the God of the Bible? How can we know the difference between the, the genuine, the true God, and a counterfeit or false God? Because nobody had any questions in their mind, it seems, when I put those false gods up there, it was false gods. They were certainly false gods. See, it's the same way with a banker. We have to study the true God, and then we can point out a false God. So, the question is, we need to study the Bible. And, and well, let me say this. The problem is that the majority of the people that we talk to recognize a counterfeit God when they see it. But some of those gods that we saw, people actually worship them. They worship those gods. So we need to know the true God. And many times we might be surprised at what the Bible has to say about a particular topic. Some of the things that I talk about this evening are going to make some of you very uncomfortable. Okay? But we have to begin in the Bible book of Genesis. Like I said, it's a Bible book of origins. So when we look at chapter 1, verse 1 of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now we may understand this and we might read it and say, yeah, that's right, God did create the heavens and the earth. But to have a better understanding of how God created, we have to lay a foundation from the Bible. You see, it says, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. But who are we talking about? One of those gods that we listed before, or is this a different god? There seems to be no limit to the questions I've heard, or to the answers I've heard to that question. If I go, to a, if I go up to a person who is a Jewish person, and I say, what god do you worship? They know what god they worship. They'll say, I worship the god of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. The one god, the creator god, the, the god of Abraham. They know that. If I were to ask a Muslim person, what God do you worship? You know what they're going to say? We worship the God that's the creator God, the God of Abraham. That's confusing to some people who haven't studied this. But when I ask a Christian, what God do you worship? You would be surprised at the number of answers I get. Some say, well, you know, God. Well, and I say, well, which God? Well, you know, God, the God of heaven. Well, yeah. That's true, it's the God of heaven, but who is it? If I call on God, just like if I call on Sir, all of these men are going to turn around. So if I call on God and I don't know who he is, who am I calling on? Let's see how the Bible identifies God. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, in the King James, the authorized King James Version, here's what it says. I appeared unto Abraham... That's the God that I said the Jews and the Muslims believe in. Unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, what's that say? Jehovah, Jehovah I was not known to them. Now, this name is first, first appears in the King James Bible, and uh, actually in the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. But you won't find that name in the King James Bible in Genesis 2, verse 4. So... The interesting thing about this name is when he says, they did not know me by my name, they knew what the name was. But they didn't recognize what that name meant fully. You see, the name Jehovah means he causes to become, or I shall prove to be who I shall prove to be. In the Hebrew language, names had rich meaning. 
like the name Methuselah. You know, Methuselah was Noah's grandfather, and when he died, the flood came shortly thereafter. In the name Methuselah, it means when he dies, it shall be sent. So when God gives his name, he says, hey, I cause to become. I shall prove to be who I shall prove to be. They knew the name, but they didn't know the character of God. You know, when I first met my wife, Tanya, I knew her name, but I didn't know her. After being married for almost 30 years, I know her a lot better now than I did when I first met her. So we can know the name, but not necessarily the character. Let's look at another verse, Psalm 83, verse 18. Then men may, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. This is in your King James Bible. Now in the New King James, it does not appear. And in many modern translations, it's not there. Now, this may be new to some of you. I want you to notice that when we look in Strong's, uh, and Strong's is a Bible dictionary, and it gives us a number for every corresponding word in Hebrew. The Old Testament was dominantly written in the Hebrew language. So when we look at Strong's, it gives me this four-letter word. If you look, the Hebrews wrote from right to left instead of from left to right. So when I look at this, it would be Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H. There are no vowels in the Hebrew language. There's only consonants. So we don't really truly know how to pronounce this divine name. But this is the best effort that men have made uh, in these latter days to be able to pronounce that name. This is what King James chose back in 1611. And this is the, what's in the King James Bible. And that's the name Jehovah. That's the Tetragrammaton. Now, if, whenever you read in your Bible, if you open it up and you look in there and you're looking at certain texts and you see LORD all capitalized, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, this is where this tetragrammaton or four-letter word for the name of God or the divine name appears in that Bible. And translators have left this out. And the total occurrence is in the King James Bible of that word Lord, which is actually Jehovah, is 6,528 times. Now, here, is, here it is in the Strong's. I just pulled it up there. It says that men may know, and it gives you the word for know, that, and you see each word has a number and a corresponding letter to it. So when we look at the name Jehovah, it's that H3068. Can you see that? Can everybody see that clearly? So when I look here, and I go to Psalm 110.1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord. Now this can be very confusing. Who's speaking to whom here? The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And this is the way it's written in the New King James and in the King James Bible. It's pretty close to that. Who is speaking to whom, and how do I know the difference? Well, the Lord, all caps, is the divine name Jehovah. So Jehovah is speaking to my Lord. Well, who is my Lord? Well, take a look here at another translation. I think I can get that to work. Here we go. For some reason, my remote's not working, Rick. Can you advance that slide for me, please? There you go. And it says, Jehovah said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is the modern King James Bible. Sit at my right hand till I place your enemies as your footstool. Now, you need to know that this is one of the most quoted texts in all of the Bible. It's in there many, many times. You can find it in Hebrews. You can find it in many places. Now, um, this is not a new or different understanding. Notice how the 1971 edition of the Living Bible, I'm not crazy about paraphrases. It worked that time. But it says, Jehovah said to my Lord, the Messiah, rule as my region, and I will subdue your enemies and make them bow low before you. So who is Jehovah speaking to? He's speaking to Jesus Christ. And we can prove that when we look at the language here. Here we go. Again, you see the Lord, H3068. Said unto my Lord, H113. Two different words. Okay. Now this word H113 in Hebrew is Adon, which is the root word or singular form of the word Adonai. And here it is. I'll pull it up for you. This will get very interesting here in a minute. I'm just trying to lay a foundation for you. This word Adon, or Adonai, appears 330 times in the King James Bible or in the Old Testament. And Adonai denotes a relationship in which one is in submission to the other. 
This might be new to some folks. It also has the connotation of being in possession of another. And in Hebrew, Adonai can be defined as God's total possession or my total submission. And Adonai also conveys the meaning of master. So this word Adonai is translated in the King James as Lord, capital L, small o-r-d, 223 times as, as master or as Lord, and as Master, 105 times, and then one time as Sir. So understanding what this means is very important if we're going to study about the true God and know who he is. Now let's get back to the Tetragrammaton just for a moment. It's interesting that Tetra is four and Grammaton is word, so we have four-letter word. You know, the devil's taken four-letter words and made them bad. But this four-letter word is the divine name. So when it says in Deuteronomy 6.4, remember I said the Hebrew said, this is the most sacred text. Is that called the Shema? Is that what that's called? I have a couple of friends here that have studied a little Hebrew. I appreciate your input there. And this is, isn't that what they would consider one of the most sacred texts as Jewish people? Absolutely. So it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now take a look at this from the literal version. It says, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Lord. Jehovah. Any questions? Any comments? Don't be afraid. Okay. No questions. Let's move along. So here are the places in the King James, the authorized King James 1611 version, where you can find that divine name Jehovah in the Bible. And you can jot that down. I'll give you just a second. Exodus 6 3, Psalm 83 18. We looked at those two. Isaiah 12, 2, and Isaiah 26, 4. Okay? Let's continue. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to, we all know where Genesis is, don't we? Let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter of the Bible. First book of the Bible, first chapter of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew. You can grab the one in front of you, take a look there, and we're going to, I'm just going to give you an overview, and then we're going to stop and look at a couple of verses. When we look at the book of Genesis, we talked about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I want you to notice in verse 3, it says, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And then you look at, at verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. The key is verse 9, then God said. And then verse 11, then God said. He's, he's speaking things into creation. He's speaking things into existence, I should say. That's the word I'm looking for. And then verse 13, so the evening and morning were the third day. Verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. We're going to look at this more later in the week. So I'm just kind of skipping through. And we go and we see again in verse 20, then God said. And then here we have in verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And then we come to verse 26. This is a verse that many Christians gloss over. And I've got to be honest. I was one of those Christians that just glossed over this verse. And it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Now, let me see. Uh, I might have to advance through a few. Yeah, there it is. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Was someone with God? He said, let us make man in our image. Someone else must have been there at that time. But what we want to do is we want to allow the Bible to interpret itself, okay? And remember, we talked about how the Old and the New Testaments go together. Correct? So when I go back here to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, we can find this phrase, in the beginning, in the New Testament. Do you know where? 
Where do we find that? John. John chapter 1, verse 1. I want you to look at this. It says here, John 1, 1. This is from the New King James Version. In the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word? That's Jesus Christ. That's right. And the Word was with God. And then it says, and the Word was God. That's kind of confusing. If you haven't studied this, this can be very confusing. I want you to look at this, and I hope you can see it in the Greek. And what we've done here is we've taken this slide. This is actually a picture that I took. And when you look at this, this is from what's called a, um, an interlinear, where it takes the Greek and the English language and it and superimposes one over the other. So you can look at each word. Okay, And I want you to notice it says, in the beginning, you see the top line is in the Greek, and the next line below it is... English. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, they put in brackets, they added that. They put the God, they added that Word, but it says the Word was with God. And I want you to look at that Greek word above the word God. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? It kind of looks like O-E-O-V. I don't know what those letters are in the Greek, I'll be honest, I'm no Greek scholar. But it looks kind of like, do you see it? O-E-O-V. And the Word was... God. Is that a different Greek word? We have two different Greek words for God. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there are three different Greek words, actually four, for the word love. So when I say, I love my wife, or I love my job, are they two different kind of loves? A lot of times you can understand that. I just want to do this for emphasis. When if you recall in, I think it's John chapter 21, when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Right? And he says, yes, Lord. And he says, feed my sheep. And then he said again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. He says, Peter, the third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know I love you. Right? Do you realize that Jesus, when he asked Peter if he loved him, the three words that are in Greek are agape, phileo, and eros. Eros is the erotic type of love. Agape is a deep-seated, self-sacrificing love. And phileo is a brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. So when, when Jesus asks Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, Peter, do you agape me? Would you give your life for me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. Is that what Jesus was asking for? No, he was asking him for this self-sacrificing love. So he says it again. Peter, do you agape me? Would you die? Would you give your life for me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I love you like a brother. In other words, he wasn't giving him the love that he wanted. The third time Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. Does that change your whole understanding of the context of those verses? Knowing that? Absolutely. It completely changes the meaning. I've heard so many sermons on that, but I've never heard that sermon. We have to study to know what the words are. So when we look at this text and we say, in the, word, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, that's very confusing if we don't understand the text that's being read. So when we look at this, this is from another uh, publication called An Emphatic Diaglot, where they do the same thing. And I want you to notice, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with the God. And the, the Greek there is ton theon, which is the father. And God, theos, was the word. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was theon. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with theon, and the word was theos. Two different words. And then even, this is actually from a Catholic publication, by the way. And even in chapter 1 here, it sa says, uh, in the English, it says, in the beginning was the logos. The logos is another word for word. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. I want you to notice that where God is all caps for the Father, and God for Christ is capital G, small od. So they recognized there was a differentiation when they translated this from Latin. I find that very interesting. An American translation says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was divine. 
Any questions? You've probably never heard some of these things before. So, let's move along. When we look at this text in John 1.1, 1, 1, it continues. Let's read it again. <clears throat> Having the understanding that we have a father and a son. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it continues in the very next verse. It says, He, that's the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Now how do we know that this was Jesus? Let's let the Bible interpret itself. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1132. And Colossians is in the New Testament. The whole Bible goes together. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. It's, it's after 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And you have Galatians, Philippians. I'm sorry, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. All right, when we get to Colossians chapter 1, I want you to notice something very important here. It says, if I begin in verse 13, Colossians 1.13, is everybody there? All right, it says, He, that's God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So who's the Son of His love? That's Jesus. That's right. It says, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. Whose blood? Jesus' blood. He, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created, what's it say? Through him and for him. Now, let's go back to Genesis. Here we go. I'm going to show this to you on the screen. Genesis 1.26. When God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, who was he talking to? He had to be talking to his son through whom he made everything. Hebrews says through whom he made the worlds. And that word is plural. So, we're going to prove this a little further in just a few minutes. So how are we made in the image of God. He says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. What is the image of God? You know, all of my life, I want to tell you, I was taught, and this is what the Bible says in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We familiar with that text? Well, I was always taught all of my life that a spirit has no form, that a spirit is just a, an invisible vapor that no one can see. But you know, as I started to study the Bible, and in Revelation it says, I shall see the face of God. How can I see the face of someone that has no form? Right? Does that make sense? So let's begin by looking at several texts that tell us a little bit about the form of God, keeping in mind that we were made in the image of God. Numbers 11.23, it says, the Lord, that's all caps, that's, it, that's the tetragrammaton, it's a, so that would be Jehovah said to Moses, has Jehovah's arm been shortened? So does God have an arm? If I'm going to believe this literally, he must. Here it says Jehovah's hand. I'm just going to highlight some of these things. I highlighted them for you. Isaiah 40 verse 2. He's got a hand. If I look at Exodus 31, 18, it talks about the finger of God. Didn't he carve the commandments with his finger? Right? I go a little further, it says, His eyes behold, his eyelids examine the children of men. If he has eyes, he must have eyelids. I go a little further, it says, He hears us, he has ears. I go further, in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says we should, we should believe everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Remember in Genesis 1, we said, God said? Well, if he said it, he must have a mouth. And we look a little further, and we see that he has a nose. He has nostrils, according to the American Standard Version. And then we go to Daniel 7, 9, and it talks about the Ancient of Days. This is the Father who, it says, his robe, we're going to talk about that more another night, 
was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. I guess some of us are made more in the image of God than others. I don't have any hair on my head. So the point is we as mankind are made in the image of God. He has a hand, he has a foot, he has fingers, he has an arm, he has eyes, he has a mouth, a nose. We will see his face, we're told in the Bible. And he has a heart. David was a man after God's own heart. So according to these verses, does God have a form? He must have a form. Do we have the attributes of God? in our form according to these verses? Yes, we do. So that brings up a question. Is there another way in which man is made in the image of God? Now let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. If you have a seminar Bible, this is page 610. Proverbs is in the middle of your Bible and most of the scriptures I'm going to have on the screen, but I want you to turn here for a reason. Proverbs the 8th chapter. And if you're looking at a seminar Bible, one of the Bibles that's in the pew, I should say a pew Bible because it's not really a seminar Bible, it's just a New King James, which is a modern English translation of the King James. You'll notice at the top of the page, what does it say there? Do you have a, uh, one of our Bibles there, Sherry? What's it say at the top of the page? Does it say something about wisdom at the very top? And, the beginning, it says the excellence of wisdom, and then it says the beginning of wisdom. Well, I have a problem with that, and you'll see why here in just a moment. We can't always believe what men have added to the meaning of Scripture. We have to take Scripture as what it says. If you notice verse 1, we are talking about wisdom here, because in verse 1 it says, Does not wisdom cry out? And then I want you to look at verse 12. Verse 12, everybody there? Chapter 8, verse 12, it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. So would you agree that in these verses we're talking about wisdom? Any disagreement there? Let's move along. As we go through these texts here, I want you to notice Proverbs 22. 8 verse 22. I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 8 verse 22. Stay here in this chapter. Notice verse 22 because we have a change of thought here. We have a change of thought here. And here's what it says. Proverbs 8, verse 22, it says, The Lord, that's all caps. Is that all caps in everybody's Bible? The Lord, that's Jehovah, that's the tetragrammaton, the, tetragrammaton, the divine name. Jehovah possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. Now, the very words, I have been established, indicate that there was a time when whatever is speaking, whoever is speaking here, was not. If this building was established in 1930, where was it in 1920? It didn't exist. So whoever is speaking here says, I have been established from everlasting. Now, the American Standard Bible here says, Jehovah possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning before the earth was. Remember we said that there was someone with God in creation. So let's continue. King James Version, New King James 8 verses 24 and 25 say, When there were no depths, I was brought forth. And I highlighted that word for a reason. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Now, it's, this is where we get very interesting. I cannot accept, what did that say again about wisdom? Beginning. The beginning of wisdom. Is there anybody here who doesn't believe that God the Father is eternal? I believe he has always been. I can't explain it, but I have faith based on what the scriptures tell me that he doesn't have a beginning. He is timeless. He has always been. Does everybody agree? Okay. The Father has always been. So, do we believe that wisdom, that he didn't have wisdom? In other words, does the Father acquire wisdom? Is this an attribute that he gains? Or because the Father is eternal, wouldn't wisdom have to be eternal? He, he's all-knowing, we say. Isn't that what we've heard and we say? 
we say God knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. So how could this be wisdom at this point? But let's continue. Because I want you to notice this word brought forth. It's translated from a, a Hebrew verb. Okay, and this Hebrew verb is only used four times in all of the Hebrew or Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. You're seeing two of them right here. This word brought forth. And here are the other two times it appears in the Bible. One of them is in Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. And here's the fourth one, Job 15, verse 7. Art thou the first man that was born, or was thou brought forth before the hills? I want you to notice that in the context of these verses, it has to do with being born. And when we go to Proverbs chapter 8, and we look at that word brought forth, right here, it literally means being born from, coming out of, the substance of, twisting or twirling out of. When you look at this in the Hebrew language, it's very interesting. So let's review. Let's read this again. The Lord, that's the divine name, possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Let me stop there for just a moment. Anybody have an NIV Bible in here? NIV? What does it say in verse 24? When there were no deaths, what's it say? I was given birth. I was given birth. That sticks closer to the Hebrew language. Very interesting. Let's continue. Verse 26. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep. It goes on. It says, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a... What? Master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Let me ask you, who is the master craftsman? Who is the master craftsman? Through whom all things were created. Who is it? It's none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the master craftsman through whom all things were created. He was beside his father as the master craftsman. God spoke, the word created. That's beautiful. And this is consistent with the rest of Scripture. Notice the New Testament. John chapter 8, verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, he's speaking to the Pharisees here, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I, I of myself, but he sent me. The Greek word for proceeded forth, notice this. I don't know how to say this word, but it means to issue, to come forth, out of, to depart or come out of, to escape, to get out. He came forth from the Father. And this goes right along with the, Jeff, the definition for brought forth in Proverbs. Micah 5, 2, another Old Testament book. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one who be, to be ruler in Israel, whose, it's kind of a weird term, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting whose goings forth in the Hebrew literally means of family descent. And it has a root word, which means the following, a going forth. That is the act, an egress, or the place of an exit. Hence, a source or product brought out. A son always comes from a father. An egress is to come out of, or an exit. Egress literally means the act of going out of. 
So when I go back to Micah 5, 2, and it says, from everlasting, a lot of people like to look at this text and say, well, that means that Jesus never had a beginning. He has always been. But this word for, from everlasting in Hebrew is olam olam, which means time out of mind. It doesn't mean of no origin. It means it's so far back that we can't even imagine it. So we look at Psalm 2, 7. Here's a prophecy. I, I will tell the decree of Jehovah said, un, I will tell the, of the decree, Jehovah said unto me, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. What does begotten mean? Well, look at the Hebrew word. Let's take a look. There we go. Here's the word begotten. Strong's 3205. A primitive root, to bear young, to beget, to show lineage to be birthed, to be born, to bring forth or bring up. And all of this goes along with Proverbs 8, 22 through 31. So let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Any questions? Any questions? Am I going too fast? Is it cold? Sorry. Okay. Any questions? Genesis chapter 2. I want you to notice we're going back to where we were before. Do we understand how we are made in the image of God? Let me ask you that first. Would you agree that we have the same attributes that we were told in Scripture? Any thoughts about that? Okay. Let's take a look. Beginning here in Genesis chapter 2, if I look beginning in verse 7, it says, And the Lord God, that's Jehovah God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. And Jehovah God planted a garden east, in Eden, eastward. And here he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground God made every tree to grow. We know this, don't we? He made everything. The man comes out of the soil. Does everybody agree with that? And, you know, we might have some here that may not take these things literally, but I believe this to be literal. I do take this literally. Okay, I believe that man was formed from the dust of the ground. Now, I want you to pick up here in verse 15. You can read this in your own time, but we need to move along. I want you to pick up in chapter 2, verse 15. It says here, now this is after Adam had, had been created. Adam named all of the animals, and he recognized he was by himself. And when he realized that all of the animals had companions, and there he was in the Garden of Eden by himself, he wanted a mate. He realized, well, they all have mates, but I don't. So take a look at verse 15. It says, Then the Lord, that's Jehovah God, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. We're going to address this text later in the series. And we notice in verse 18, it says, It is not good. God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Well, as we look down through here, pick up in verse 21. And the Lord, that's Jehovah God, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And, and he slept. That's Adam slept. And he, God, took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, let's go back to our PowerPoint. I want you to notice, Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Isn't that what he said? What does he mean? Eve, where did she come from? She came from Adam. You know, everybody here came out of a woman. Everyone. But not Eve. Eve came out of a man. Eve was the very substance of Adam. Very interesting. That rib that God took from Adam, 
is what God made into Eve. She brought him to the man. And he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He recognized that she was part of him. So would you agree by reading this text that Adam preceded Eve? Okay. We, could we say that Adam and Eve were the same substance? Could we say they were the same nature? Adam was human, she was human. Could we say they served the same purpose? They were to have dominion and have children and multiply, right? And fill the earth. That was their purpose. And then he says, the two shall become one. You know, Jesus said, I and my father are one. A lot of people read this text and they think, well, that means just one person. But the Father and Son are distinct beings. Jesus and his Father are one like Adam and Eve are one. They're the same substance. How can I say that? Didn't we just read in Proverbs 8 that he says, I was brought forth? How was he brought forth? He must be the substance of the Father. He had to be, he says, this is my begotten Son. This day I have begotten thee. A father always precedes a son. Do you know, is anybody in here as old as your dad? Are you as old? Bill, are you as old as your father? That's impossible, right? Is God telling us the truth? Or is he lying? Are we worshiping a counterfeit God? Do we believe that the Father and the Son are the same exact age? Or do we believe what the Father says? I am a Father, and this is my Son. I have begotten Him. Where do we fall in this topic? Because many people believe they're co-equal and co-eternal. How many of us have ever heard that? I've heard it all of my life. Where do I find that in the Bible? Well, let's continue. John 1.18 says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Where's the bosom? It's where my ribs are. Eve came from the bosom of Adam. John says that the Son came from the bosom of the Father. He's the substance of the Father. Jesus is divine because his Father is divine. Just as Eve was human, because Adam was human. Adam and Eve were of the same substance, the same as the Father and the Son are of the same substance. I want you to notice John 3.16, and we overcomplicate this so many times. For God, that's the Father, so loved the world that he gave who? His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why don't we believe this for the way it reads? Why do Christians and churches take this text and they say, well, wait a minute, God, it's more complicated than that. It's very simple. God the Father has a son who is the substance of the Father, as Eve was the substance of Adam. We were made in the image of God. He's giving us that imagery in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And let me ask you, for anyone here that's a parent, and I am not a parent, but let me tell you something. I can imagine, I can only imagine what it must be like for any of you who have a child to, if someone were going to take that child's life, what would you do? You would do whatever you could to get in, in between whoever is going to hurt that child and that child. Am I right? I don't care if that kid is 40 years old and you're 80 years old. An 80-year-old parent's going to say, no, you take me first. But the love that the father has is that he says, I will give you my son. That's love beyond what we can comprehend. Otherwise, if it wasn't his son, who was it? God's not telling me the truth if it wasn't truly a son. John 17, 3. Not yet. John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Who's the only true God? The Father. I've heard people say that it's all about Jesus, and according to this statement, according to this verse, it's about the Father and His Son. 
You see, we have to know the Father, and we have to know the way to the Father. And that's through Christ Jesus, through whom God made everything. Now here's the question, why is this important? You say, well, who cares? What's the difference? I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. It, all this stuff, it doesn't matter. Oh, wait a minute. Are you worshiping the true God, the genuine? Or do you believe in a counterfeit God? You see, the devil has masked who God truly is and counterfeited him. And most of Christianity will tell you, and if I'm stepping on your toes, it's not to hurt you, it's to help you to see what the Bible truly says, friends. That's what this ministry is all about. Most of Christianity will tell you they believe that there is one God, but they define him this way. There is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. How many of us have heard that? Some haven't. Has, has anybody here not heard that? Nobody has not heard that. We've all, I think we've all heard that if we've been in, in church at all. This is what we're taught. But is this what we've seen from the Bible? No. Can I find this in the Bible? No. If Christ came from his Father, how could he be co-eternal with the Father? Remember, a father always precedes a son. Now, I want to show you a quote from a, from a very prominent Christian church. And here's how it begins. It starts off this way. It says, as human beings, we have been made in the image and likeness of God himself. Isn't that what we've been talking about? Can we say amen to that? Amen. But, after this, for me, according to what the Bible says, this starts to fall apart. Notice what it says. I'm going to continue the statement. It says, as human beings, we have been made in the image and likeness of God himself. God who is one and yet three simultaneously. God, the most holy trinity, in the communion of three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each of these persons is a uniqueness. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But that the Father is not the Son, nor is the Son the Father, and the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, and yet together the three uniquenesses are in fact one. Can anyone explain that to me? That's confusion. If this doesn't confuse you, I don't know what will. This is a mystery. I don't know of anyone who can truly understand this, and it's certainly not what the Bible says. And how could this possibly be when the Bible over overwhelmingly says this, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God who? The Father of whom are all things and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things and through whom we live. One God, the Father. That's pretty clear. It's very easy to understand. But often I hear this statement. You ever hear this? The mystery of the Trinity. This is a phrase that is used by many people that are my good friends who can't explain the truth about God from the scriptures. And some are refusing to see what the Bible truly says. You see, this Trinity is a mystery because it's a man-made doctrine. It was formed at the Nicene Council in 320, 325 A.D., and its origin goes all the way back to Nimrod, Samarimus, and Tammuz. And if you've been taught that God is a trinity, I invite you to study what the Bible says and see what it says instead of going by what we've been taught and told and had tradi traditionally learned. We are told in the Bible that Jesus is the Son of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he's God the Son. In fact, notice the following. Colossians chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, in whom we read this earlier, we have redemption through his blood, that's Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the image of the invisible God. And then John 17, 3, 
And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Who's the only true God? Does it say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No. That they may know you. Well, I, I move along. John 6, 57. As the living Father sent me, this is Jesus speaking, and I live because of the Father. That's pretty clear. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. You see, Jesus is divinity. And we can be partakers of the divine nature of Christ, but we will not be divinity. The Father and the Son are divine. Jesus is telling us in this verse and throughout Scripture that his very existence is because of his Father. John 5, 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. He gave his Son his life. Notice that Jesus has a God. Mark 15, 34. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus has a God. Does the Father have a God? No. And I move along. John 20, 16 and 17. Jesus said to Mary, he said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Jesus has a God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 15, 6. That you may be, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 3, 12. Boy, I mean, it just goes on. I could just do this all night, friends. I'm just picking a few select quotes from the Bible. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. This is Christ speaking. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. So Jesus is speaking. He has a God which is the Father. And I want this written on me. This is what I want written on me, the name of the Father and the name of the city. What about you? Do you want the name of the one true God that's not a mystery? And so often I hear people say, well, God's a mystery. We can't understand him. But God is trying to reveal himself to us through his son, through his word, the Bible, and he wants his name to be written on us. And if we don't have the name of God written on us, guess what's written on us? I'm going to show you. Revelation 17, 4 and 5. The woman, we're going to talk about this more as the series goes on, was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls and having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. Is this a godly woman? No. Even the unclean things of her fornication and upon her forehead was a name written. What was it? Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Friends, do a study on the word mystery in the Bible, and you will find that this is the only time in the Bible that it's used in a mysterious or unknowing way. Every other time in the Bible that the word mystery is used, it's about God revealing himself to us. God is not a mystery. Will we be learning about him for eternity? Yes. Are there things about him we don't know and probably will never know? Yes. But he is not a mysterious God that we cannot know. That's why Christ came to reveal his Father to us. What's the name of, the, of God that we want written on us? That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. So in closing, I want you to notice these texts right here where it uses, the Bible uses the phrase God the Father. There are 12 of them in the King James Bible where it uses the phrase God the Father. I find that very interesting because we see that the, there are 12 foundations, there were 12 apostles. 12 is a pretty sacred number. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but I think it's an interesting thing. So let me ask you, how many times in the Bible can I find this, the phrase God the Son? That's how many times it appears in the Bible. Zero. 
How many times can I find the phrase, God the Holy Spirit, in the Bible? I'll put it up for you again. Oops, I'm sorry. There it is. Zero. So we find God the Father 12 times, God the Son zero times, God the Holy Spirit zero times. But where do we find in the Bible the phrase, the Son of God, with regard to Jesus Christ? This is beautiful. There are 48 times in 47 different verses that we find the Son of God regarding Jesus Christ. Many of us have probably never heard this, and it might be abrasive or offensive to you. But friends, if we're not studying and proving all things by Scripture, we will be fooled, and we will be, have the counterfeit God and not the genuine God. It puts us in a dangerous place that we could be worshiping a counterfeit God. Jesus came to reveal his Father to us. In fact, the very last text in Genesis chapter 2 says, And they were both naked, that's Adam and Eve, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were naked and they were not ashamed. But what has happened? This is, they became ashamed, as we're going to see. We're going to pick this up in Genesis chapter 3 tomorrow. And I want to continue with this same theme. But as we go through this series, you're going to see more and more ways that the Father is truly a Father and that the Son is truly a Son. If we don't believe what God's saying, then we're following the traditions of men. It's just, I just have to be that bold about it, and I have to put it that plainly. So tomorrow night, we'll be discussing the world's most important prophecy. And I want to close with this thought. In nearly every religion, man seeks a God. Isn't that true? Doesn't matter what the religion is. You pick it, man is seeking some form of God. But true Christianity, when we look at it, we find a God that is seeking us. You see, men have to seek after God, but God is coming. He wants us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants a relationship with you personally. So we're going to take an in-depth look at this tomorrow night, and you're not going to want to miss it.